Well, first of all, I just want to find out, are you guys having a good time? Yeah. <laughs> so then the other thing I want to find out is how many new people have you gotten to know? Just hold up here, is it three? Is it six, eight? Woo! Whoa, not enough hands. I'll take toes. You know, it doesn't have to be fingers. We go with toes. So I just wanted to mention two people, um, and that's Michael Olmsted and Gary Milken. They are Malkin. They are the people who have brought us all this wonderful music. And for me, it's added enormously. After a session, when you just hear that soothing music, even I get calm. So <laughs> um, it's just wonderful. So can we just give a hand to Michael and Gary? We're now going to hear from uh, Masayuka Koga. He is a master sakuchi. Sakuhachi player, and he has won uh, a Grammy Award. So uh, we're going to, we're, we're pretty lucky. Or it's, he was nominated for a Grammy Award. And right after he provides us some really lovely, lovely music, we're going to uh, hear from Shinichi Takamura. He is a, um, he is the man behind the globe. Uh, and he is trying to teach us ways to kind of look at the earth in a new way, look at our home in a, in a different way. Uh, he's a cultural anthropologist. Uh, who, um, I don't know, went global. So um, uh, please join me in welcoming Master, uh, Master Koga.
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Takemura. I'm so pleased and honored to be here to present our Tangible Earth at this uh, Global Philanthropy Forum and to talk about the uh, global perspective provided through our globe. Um, our world is so globalized and everybody said we need to think globally, but we don't have the global media in the real sense, the global media which visualize what is really going on on our planet and the global media which enables us to think globally. And I'm very sorry that still now, school children born in 21st century are learning geography, geology, and global environment using the two-dimensional map invented in 16th century or using the conventional static globe which never represents the exceptional beauty and dynamism of our planet. That is why we created this. This is the world's first interactive digital globe, interactive in the sense that you can spin it with your hand in any direction, but you can zoom in on the uh, specific areas using the magnifying pointer function like this. In this case, I'm showing you some uh, image of the uh, Earth's surface seen from space, uh, from the viewpoint of the space shuttle. So we are approaching the Himalaya glaciers, and we, if we move to the desert of Middle East, we will get this kind of image. And we are move on to Sahara. And uh, if we put on the uh, day-night terminator, it's real time, and this globe represents the uh, present situation of our planet. So you can see people in Japan is now greeting sunrise and at the opposite side of the globe, you can see people in Brazil, maybe, is now um, enjoying sunset. And uh, if we put on the uh, real-time cloud data, uh, the cloud data is updated every one hour through the internet from the satellite. And yeah, now we are showing you the uh, animation of the cloud uh, movement over the last four days. And when the animation stops, uh, it will represent the uh, present situation, present cloud distribution. So uh, now animation is stopping, and it seems that the uh, people in California is enjoying fine weather. Yeah. <laughs> But please note that this cloud is swirling in this thin layer of the layer of the air. The uh, layer of the air, the troposphere, is in real life about 10 kilometers thick uh, up to the altitude where jets fly. But at this scale, it becomes on less than one millimeter thick. So even children can see how fragile the layer of the air is. And this kind of the uh, analog tactility is very important. And that is why we create this kind of the analog uh, tactile globe uh, rather than creating the uh, 3D CG globe in the uh, tablet or PC. Even children can see how fragile, and even the space shuttle is flying only two or three centimeters uh, above. And you can see every miracle of life on Earth is happening in this thin layer of the uh, one millimeters. So I will show you some other uh, aspect of our living planet. It's a serpentine ocean currents. At the opposite side of the globe, you can see the Gulf currents, which conveys lots of uh, solar uh, thermal energy to the northern uh, Europe to make the climate of the northern Europe far milder than for the altitude. And uh, you can see the sea surface temperature. You can see, this, again, the serpentine kuroshio, the black currents. And it's visualizing the seasonal variation, seasonal change of the uh, uh, sea surface temperature. So uh, it's just like the uh, breathing of our, uh, the Earth. And uh, if we uh, show some biodiversity contents, 
Uh, this is represent, now the globe is showing the, uh, the uh, plankton blooming uh, detected by the polar orbit satellite with the uh, trace of humpback whales attracted by the, uh, uh, the planktons. So uh, we don't know how they know it, but they actually they know that the, their restaurant is around here <laughs> in the <laughs> Arctic. <laughs> and at the opposite side of the globe, you will see the very amazing birds. That couple of birds uh, start migrating uh, from the Arctic areas and uh, they go south separately, one along the African coast and one along the uh, South American coast. But they encounter again somehow without using any GPS cell phone asking to each other, where are you now, or something. <laughs> but actually, they encounter like this. Even researchers never know how they communicate to each other. And if we overlay the plankton again, you can see when they reach Antarctic, the, uh, the restaurant is ready, and they start serving lots of <laughs> um, so, um, what is amazing here is that <clears throat> birds are amazing, of course, but what is also amazing is that we are living in such an age that we can visualize the living dynamism of our planet in this way, in such a comprehensive way. So we, maybe we are the first generation in the human history who recognize the di living dynamism of our planet. So why do we teach children using two-dimensional map? <laughs> And we need to disseminate this kind of globe uh, all around the world. And let's go back again to the, uh, uh, the uh, topic of global uh, perspective. Because um, uh, uh, we, we human society really needs a global perspective uh, in the various dimensions. Now I'm showing you the uh, El Nino phenomenon, which brings about the, uh, the abnormal weather all around the world. And I'm now um, showing you the typical El Nino phenomenon. The uh, warm sea uh, concentration, seawater concentration is found here, like this, at the, uh, the west east part of the uh, Pacific. And uh, you can see, well, normally the, uh, the concentration of warm seawater will be found in the western part of the Pacific uh, due to the uh, strong east trade winds. But the, uh, in the face of El Nino, the, uh, it shifts to the east, and the, uh, the uh, eastern trade wind uh, gets weak, and the, uh, it moves to the west, uh, east, and the, uh, it brings about the uh, the abnormal weather all around the world. One example here is uh, the, uh, it's based on the uh, UN data. The uh, flood um, events in Colombia, for example, uh, correlate, correlates dramatically uh, to the El Nino La Nina patterns. And also, uh, it, uh, normally, the uh, warm seawater concentrated in the Western Pacific and brings uh, lots of uh, rainfall to the jungle, uh, tropical rainforest in Indonesia. But the, uh, at this case, the, uh, they, they will suffer from the uh, drought, Australian drought, and the uh, extensive uh, wildfire in Indonesia, and also the cold summer in Japan, or uh, it correlates somehow with the uh, El Nino phenomenon in the in Indian Ocean. Uh, called dipole mode. So uh, uh, abnormal weather is correlated to each other. The, it's called the uh, teleconnection. So uh, any local event should be recognized in the uh, global context, in the uh, context of the uh, teleconnection, global te teleconnection uh, of the uh, uh, climate variation uh, like the El Nino. And now I'm showing you the another example, this is the uh, accumulation of the earthquake. Now here you can see the uh, uh, very earthquake-prone 
area in here, California, the uh, San Andreas uh, Fault. And at the opposite side of the uh, Pacific Plate, you can see the biggest concentration of seismic events, Japan, the uh, cross-section of four tectonic plates. And I'm now replaying the uh, March 11th event, the uh, exceptional magnitude of earthquake you will see here on March 11th, like this. Yeah, how exceptional it is. And the, uh, after devastating the uh, Tohoku area, the tsunami rippled throughout the Pacific. This is a uh, replay, a representation of the tsunami event. But point here is that the tsunami ripple throughout Pacific, throughout the world, not only as a physical tide, but also the socioeconomic tide. Because the supply chain nowadays is globally connect interconnected. So, uh, the, for example, Toyota lost, uh, reduces reduced their car production, not only in Japan, but also uh, more than 50% in India, China, and the US uh, due to the uh, shortage of the, uh, some parts, uh, which was suppo suppo supposed to be uh, produced in the Tohoku area. And six months after March 11th, um, Japanese companies were severely hit again by the uh, uh, flooding in Thailand as you know. So nowadays, the natural disaster is no longer a local event. You might be hit, you might, your company or your business, your life might be affected by the disaster at the opposite side of the globe. So we always need to have the global perspective. And uh, I'm talking now about the uh, global risk transfer if we, uh, we can find the uh, global risk transfer in various uh, aspects. For example, now I'm showing you the global circulation of the air pollutants. Blue represent sulfur dioxide, green nitrogen dioxide, uh, yellow CO, and these are emitted from might be your country, and, but the, uh, it circulates all around the world uh, globally. So by looking at this kind of uh, image of the uh, air pollutant, hidden aspect of our planet, uh, even children can see how we are connected to each other, sharing one globe. And if we look at the southern hemisphere, it seems that it's very clean, free from the pollution. But if we overlay some other layer, like ozone layer, you will find the ozone hole, even 25 years after the ban of the fronts. And so the uh, ozone layer in the southern hemisphere is much affected by the uh, uh, front emission from the northern hemisphere. So, Thus, we are so connected to each other, sharing one globe. And if we talk about the uh, ultimate global risk transfer, we can help talking about the uh, increase of CO2 emission and uh, global warming, climate change. Now I'm representing the uh, CO2 concentration, seasonal variation, uh, very famous zigzag patterns, and um, in these uh, 20, 30 years, it increases much, and it reaches about you know, 400 ppm already. Um, as you see here, the uh, urbanization, urban population increase, uh, very rapid, uh, skyrocketing, uh, urban population, especially after the 1980s, the mega cities, more than 10 million, uh, proliferating in Asian countries and skyrocketing demand of the uh, fossil fuels um, and the deforestation. 
it causes such a uh, rapid increase of the CO2 concentration and the, uh, partly due to this anthropogenic uh, cause the, uh, the, uh, our the, uh, global uh, atmosphere, we affected much to the, our atmosphere. And uh, uh, the global warming is progressing, as you know. Uh, this is the simulation of the global warming in this century uh, based on the A1B scenario of IPCC, uh, emission scenario of IPCC. And if we stop around uh, 2070, you can see the uh, uh, rapid temperature rise, especially at the Arctic areas and the Tibetan Himalaya areas, which is covered with the ice, uh, which originally have the albedos, and 90% of albedo, which reflect sun, sunlight. But if, we lose, if they lose the ice uh, albedo, uh, the, uh, they start absorbing 90% of the uh, solar thermal energy, and the, uh, the global warming process will be much accelerated, as you know. So, and uh, if we overlay the polar orbit satellite data of the, about the diminishing sea ice in Arctic areas, uh, it's so dramatic. And also, if we focus on the uh, Himalaya areas, you can see such a uh, drastic the, uh, decrease of the uh, glacier ice and it leads to the uh, scarce water in the downstream of the uh, Yangtze River, so especially uh, Yellow Rivers. Espe Yellow Rivers is, uh, used to be like this, but uh, nowadays uh, we observe uh, over the last uh, 15 years the uh, no flow events. The, uh, so uh, the global warming leads to the uh, water scarcity and the uh, food crisis. Uh, even children can understand this kind of uh, um, effect. And also, uh, if we look at the, uh, the elevation of the uh, coastal areas, uh, the uh, red zone represents the uh, low elevation coastal zone. Uh, less than 10 meters of the, uh, above sea level. So you can see the, uh, uh, in southern part of the Mekongs, um, uh, Bangladesh, Thailand, eastern Tokyo, uh, London, New York, uh, many mega cities are located at the low elevation coastal zone, but especially in China, uh, nearby, uh, including Shanghai, Qingdao, Tianjin. Uh, this area includes more than 150 million people in low elevation coastal zone, which is very vulnerable to the sea level rise, flooding, liquidization, etc. So uh, thus, our, uh, we are facing a big challenge. Uh, and this kind of uh, simulation makes us pessimistic. But I think this simulation represents hope as well. We humans are tiny existence, just like, say, fleas on the back of a huge elephant. But this flea, tiny flea, start sensing and monitoring the subtle change in the body temperature and the physical condition of the host elephant, Earth. And naming it global warming and climate change and uh, start to cope with it. And every day, now I'm representing you the, uh, the polar orbit satellite and the data of the sea surface temperature uh, sensed by the polar orbit satellite Shizuku, Japanese orbit satellite. And they are monitoring the uh, very subtle change of the sea surface temperature, the uh, body temperature of the, the elephant. <coughs> and uh, uh, this kind of data is used for uh, uh, the prediction of the El Nino phenomenon, uh, climate variation, and uh, used for the uh, preventing the, uh, severe, uh, the damage by the severe drought and uh, flooding in the uh, India, uh, African countries, and Australia. And also, the, uh, there is a, a 
as the panelists yesterday mentioned, the uh, wildfire is the uh, damaging the forest uh, rapidly, but the, uh, this is the uh, uh, data of the uh, wildfire uh, sensed by the, uh, observed by the orbit satellite. And um, this kind of the uh, real-time data uh, observation uh, is disseminated to uh, some countries like Brazil, and the, uh, it is uh, used for the uh, um, uh, preventing the uh, illegal deforestation, for example. Uh, thus, the uh, we are uh, we have a lot of things to do, and the, uh, anyway, in order to make our society sustainable, we need to be more creative, and. We are the species uh, which has been very creative and in intelligent um, of the thousands of years. Um, this is a replay of the uh, hurricane. Sorry. Typhoon Haiyan uh, with the trace. And uh, if we replay, so this kind of the uh, uh, typhoon monitoring will be uh, provided on this globe uh, in real time in this year. And uh, also, I will lastly, I will show you the alternative simulation of the uh, global warming. Alternative simulation represents the big change, um, big variation of the temperature rise. The, uh, in the scenario uh, in which the, uh, we mitigate the temperature rise within two uh, degrees, you can see the big change in the temperature rise, especially in the Himalayas and Tibetan areas. So this is an alternative uh, simulation. We can visualize through this globe and simulation the, also the alternative future, our choice. Uh, there is another path to the, uh, create a uh, different future to make a difference. So uh, even agricultural revolution was the creative reaction to the uh, climate change, as you know. Uh, in the younger driest age about uh, 12,000 years ago. So uh, to be sustainable, we can be creative. We should be creative and we can be creative. So this is my message through um, uh, Tangible Earth. And maybe this kind of image of the globe you have seen many times. Of course, and this might be the first time you see our globe in this way, but the, uh, the image of the globe, this kind of globe, might have been in your mind, or might have been in the mind of the Homo sapiens for the thousands of generations. So my work is to visualize what is already in your mind. And this is the essential part of the uh, art and design. Thank you very much. Thank you.